Mr. Fonsell, I noticed when we adjourned that your client is sitting. Could you ask him to stand for the duration? <laughs> the inference is irresistible that initially Mr. Tonga wanted to bring the investigating officers under the impression that he did not know the names of Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni. It must be remembered that Mr. Tonga's affidavit was not just an ordinary police statement. It was taken down in anticipation of the accused entering into a plea and sentence agreement and in the presence of his attorney, Mr. de Gras. The final typed version of this affidavit was handed to Mr. de Gras and Mr. Tonga for consideration before it was signed. It was a statement taken by an extremely senior police officer. It cannot be equated to a, quote, run-of-the-mill, end quote, police statement. In fact, Mr. Tonga confirms in this statement that, quote, the facts contained in this affidavit are true to the best of my knowledge and belief. I am aware that I make myself liable to prosecution where I willfully, were I willfully to state anything therein, sick, that I know to be false or do not believe to be true. Paragraph. I have been informed that were anybody to be arrested and prosecuted in regard to any incident or fact that I refer to in this affidavit, I may be called as a witness to testify for the state. I have further been informed that were criminal proceedings to ensue, a copy of this affidavit may be made available to the accused and or his legal counsel prior to the trial to enable them to prepare for his, her or their defense. It was agreed in terms of the common cause facts that the accused and the deceased had a booking at a restaurant in Somerset West, which was made by the staff members of the Cape Grace Hotel. Mr. Tonga, however, testified that when Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni did not show up at the predetermined place in Guguletu, it was he who suggested to the Dewanis that he take them to Somerset West. This was indeed a strange coincidence. Mr. Tonga's explanation as to why he engaged the child locks of both the rear doors cannot be believed. He stated that he did not know on which side the accused would sit and on which side the deceased would sit. Seeing that this was all part of a cons conspiracy with the accused in which the accused was going to be the second person to be dropped from the vehicle, it is simply not a credible explanation. How was the accused going to get out of the vehicle? The fact that he engaged the child locks was also not mentioned in his affidavit. It appears that Mr. Tongo decided to give this evidence only after he had been confronted by the CCTV footage where this is clearly shown. It will be recalled that Mr. Tongo testified that it was agreed with Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni that the accused would leave the 15,000 rand for the killing in the cubbyhole of the vehicle. Mr. Tongo conceded that Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni were dangerous individuals. He knew that they would be armed. He are ever drove to the agreed hijack spot with the deceased and the accused in the car without the money being in the cubbyhole or without even establishing from the accused where it, whether he had the money must, uh, with him. It must further be remembered that according to Mr. Tongo, the initial plan was that the hijack would take place when Mr. Tongo first drove into Guguletu. At that stage, there was therefore no suggestion that they would drive to Somerset West, and Mr. Tonga knew that the money was not in the cubbyhole. Yet, in his affidavit, he stated that after he had picked up the accused and the deceased at the Cape Grace Hotel, quote, the accused instructed me to first drive around town as he wanted to see what the city looked like at night, and then through to Somerset West, where they plan to have dinner, end quote. This is irreconcilable with his evidence that it was his, Mr. Tonga's decision to take the couple to Somerset West. When confronted with this, it was again a mistake. 
Importantly, Mr. Tonga testified that when the hijack did not take place at the place and time initially agreed upon, he received a text message from the accused inquiring from him what is happening. When it was pointed out to him that there was no such SMS record on, the rec on record, which was common cause between the parties, he stated that the records were wrong. This is yes, a, yet a further untruth told by Mr. Tongo in an attempt to incriminate the accused. Mr. Tongo also claimed that there was telephonic communication between him and the accused while they were underway from Guguletu to the Strand. Once again, he was confronted with the documentary evidence that there was no such communication indicated on the documentation. Once again, Mr. Tongo stated that there might be a problem with the records, although they were agreed upon between the state and the defense. As regards the events on the Saturday evening, on their arrival at the Strand, Mr. Tongo testified that he and accused and the accused were walking ahead of the woman on their way to the restaurant. The accused then asked him softly what had happened. He explained to the accused that the men were delayed as a result of a problem with a motor vehicle, but that they were going to wait in Guguletu. The accused then told him that he must make sure that everything is, quote, going well, end quote. However, in Mr. Tonga's affidavit, he states the following, quote, Dewani and the lady first took a stroll on the beach, and then I walked with them to the restaurant. At the entrance, the lady went in, and Dewani turned around and spoke to me. He asked what is happening. He appeared to be stress, uh, stressed, and he threatened me. He said if the job was not done that evening, he was going to kill me. I told him that I would call the man I had arranged for the job and asked him what was happening. I then went to my car while Dewani went into the restaurant to have supper. When confronted with this statement in his affidavit, he said that the contents thereof was not the truth. The accused said he never said, uh, the, uh, Mr. Tonga stated that the accused never said he was going to kill him. He stated that this was a mistake made, maybe, I quote, by the one who typed it, typed it wrong, maybe just a mistake. He was then asked, quote, did you tell Colonel Bartason in the presence of your attorney when this statement was taken down that the accused at the Surfside restaurant asked you what happened and then threatened you by saying that if the job was not done that evening, he was going to kill you? Did you tell Colonel Barkais in that? I never said that, lady. I said that I must remember that I am the one who is having the knowledge. So Colonel Barkais simply wrote down, although you never said it, it's the same as the mistake that he made by saying, oh yeah, end quote. This story about the accused threatening Mr. Tonga must be considered in view of the objective evidence, namely the audio recordings. They show that at 21.31.55, Mr. Malombo called Mr. Kwabe. In the course of this telephone discussion, Mr. Malombo told Mr. Kwabe, quote, it's that thing we were talking about, it must happen today. End quote. It is common cause that Mr. Malombo had not spoken to Mr. Tongo since 1838 that evening, and yet in the above mentioned telephone call, he is clearly instructing Mr. Kwabe that the hijacking must take place that night. How could Mr. Malombo have known about the discussion and the threat between the accused and Mr. Tongo? Mr. Tonga further testified that during the discussion between him and the accused whilst they were in Somerset West slash Strand, the accused told him that he had put the money in the pouch of the front passenger seat. He further testified that he conveyed this message to Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni. He cannot recall whether that was done by means of a text. <clears throat> 
after this evidence, he was confronted with what he had stated in his affidavit where he stated the following. Quote, whilst I was driving, it was either on the way to Somerset West or after we had departed from Somerset West, I realized that Dewani had not discussed the money that was destined to be paid over to the men. I then sent him a text message, don't forget the money. He then answered also by text, informing me that the money was in an envelope in the pouch behind the passenger seat. In other words, at the original time when the hijack was supposed to take place, the accused had not placed any money in the vehicle. Mr. Tonga concedes that this paragraph reflects what he had told Lieutenant Colonel Barkeysen, but states that it was not the truth. His explanation about this discrepancy mirrors a theme that came through throughout his evidence. I quote, it's going back to what I said, lady. As I said, as time goes by or goes on, some things just resurface. And now I can remember some of the things much better or well, end quote. The accused in his plea explanation stated that after the attackers had hijacked the vehicle, there was a person with a gun in his hand next to him on the seat. Mr. Tongo stated that that was a lie because it was he, Mr. Tongo, that was forced into the rear seat and was sitting next to the accused. He did not have a firearm. Once again, Mr. Tongo was confronted with the following statement in his affidavit. Quote, the first man, that's Kwabe, got into the driver's seat and pushed me over to the passenger seat. The second man got into the back of the vehicle with Dewani and the lady. Mr. Tonga found himself in a predicament that he had now placed himself in the back seat with the child locks engaged. He needed to explain now how he would have left the vehicle. His evidence in this regard is virtually incomprehensible and totally irreconcilable with his affidavit in which he stated that the driver, in brackets, Mr. Kwabe, close brackets, put his firearm against my head and ordered me out of the vehicle, end quote. Once again, he stated that this allegation, that Mr. Kwabe put a firearm against his head, was another mistake. A CCTV clip was shown in which the accused and Mr. Tonga were on the terrace of the Cape Grace Hotel. According to the accused, uh, Mr. Tongo, the accused continually kept asking him whether he was fine and also wanted to know from him whether the job had been done. Mr. Tongo replied that he did not know. The accused also asked him whether Mr. Tongo had any information as to whether the men really did what they were supposed to do. This was obviously a vitally important discussion. Yet, in Mr. Tongo's affidavit, not a word is mentioned about it. It is appropriate to quote from the affidavit. I quote, the police then took me through to the Cape Grace Hotel. When we arrived, there was a marked police vehicle from the Harare police station also parked there. When we got to the reception, I saw another two policemen standing with Dewani in the reception area. I then pointed out Dewani to them. Dewani spoke to me briefly and inquired whether I was okay. The policeman then had a discussion while I sat on the couch. I then heard the policeman referring to the lady as Dewani's wife. That was the first time that I realized that the lady that Dewani wanted us to murder was his wife. Dewani then went to the police, with the police, to another office." End quote. It is clear that Mr. Tongo's evidence that the accused wanted to know whether the job had been done or whether the young men had done what they were supposed to do was something that he had made up to incriminate the accused once he had viewed the CCTV footage. It is also common cause that Mr. Tongo never, during the course of all these discussions, asked the accused for his 5,000 rand remuneration. <clears throat> 
It will be recalled that Mr. Tongo testified that the accused hand him, handed him an envelope with a thousand rand on Tuesday, the 16th of November, 2016. However, in his affidavit, he makes no mention of having received any money from the accused. He makes mention of this for the first time in a statement dated the 22nd of December, 2010, most probably after he had been confronted with the CCTV footage. In that statement, he states that he was scared to admit that he had received money because he believed that it would increase his participation in the offence. In his evidence, however, he had a different explanation for not disclosing this. And I quote, the reason for that, the reason for me to admit that with them, and I did not admit that at the beginning or on the beginning, it's because I was scared, my lady, for such a big job that I have done, then now I get only an amount of a thousand rand, end quote. It appears far more probable that Mr. Tonga did not want to reveal the fact that he received the thousand rand from the accused as it would have flown in the face of his entire story. Another strange aspect of his evidence is the fact that he did not throw away the empty plastic bag after he was in the toilet. He rather left the hotel carrying the empty plastic bag, which on his own version he was carrying by the handles. During a viewing of the CCTV footage, it was pointed out to the court that there is a shadow of something inside the plastic bag and that the manner in which Mr. Tonga was carrying the bag also indicated that there was something inside. The purpose of this evidence was that it was put to Mr. Tonga that there was a thank you card from the accused in the envelope with a thousand rand. Mr. Tonga denied this. In cross-examination, Mr. Tonga deals with this as follows. Quote, that's not true, my lady. The plastic bag is a little bit hard. If you are holding it correctly on the top side, that's now where the handles are, it might appear that there is something inside the plastic bag, whereas as it is empty and with nothing inside. It might appear to you as if there is something inside, whereas there is actually nothing inside. This answer speaks for itself. As stated above, Mr. Tonga was clear that the only role that Monde Malombo played was as a go-between between, between him, Mr. Kwabe, and Mr. Ngeni. As he was cross-examined, the thread of his evidence that, quote, as time goes by, he can remember more and more, end quote, end quote continued. He could then remember that he phoned Mr. Mlombo on his way to Somerset West because he wanted to know from Mr. Mlombo why Kwabe and Mgeni did not do the job. Eventually, he conceded that Mr. Mlombo's role included assisting him, Mr. Tongo, quote, to make sure that everything just happens, end quote. When Mr. Tonga was confronted with the various audio recordings of telephone, recalls, telephone calls which make it clear that Mr. Malombo played a much bigger role than simply being the link or an assistant to Mr. Tonga, he kept on protecting Mr. Malombo by sticking to his version that he was merely an assistant. Mr. Malombo was forced to concede during cross-examination that he was the person who was actually in control of the events on the Saturday night. The contents of the audio recordings in this regard become significant. I quote from an audio recording of a call from Mr. Mlombo to Mr. Tonga from the Protea cordless handset. This call was made at 18.38 on Saturday, 13 November. It must be record, recorded that this is only the words of Mr. Mlombo. One cannot hear what the person on the other side is saying. I quote, no, there's two of them. Yes, huh? There's five of us, remember? So you will leave him here with, uh, it is what? Oh, so the car should get there and get wa washed. 
No, then I hear you, Grootman, at that place. Mr. Tonga was asked about the reference to there are five of us. He tried to explain that the five people that Mr. Malombo was referring to was himself, Mr. Malombo, Mr. Kwabe, Mr. Mgeni, and the accused. However, Mr. Malombo did not testify that he ever counted the accused as one of the five. From the foregoing, it is clear that Mr. Kondo Tonga contradicted his affidavit made to Lieutenant Colonel Bark Hasen in virtually every material respect. His evidence is also inherently contradictory. In some instances, it makes no sense, and in others, his explanations are laughable. His evidence is contradicted on material points by his accomplices, Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mlombo. But apart from the contradictions, the entire story, as told by Mr. Tongo, is highly improbable. I say this for the following reasons. The accused met Mr. Tongo at the airport when he was looking for a taxi to take him and his wife to the Cape Grace Hotel. Mr. Tonga was a shuttle operator. On all accounts, he was neatly dressed, and his car was in a good condition. It was never suggested that the meeting between the accused and Mr. Tonga was prearranged. In other words, the accused simply approached Mr. Tonga because he was the first ta taxi driver that he came across as he walked out of the airport. On their way to the Cape Grace Hotel, Mr. Tonga attempted to sell his services as a guide to the accused and his wife, offering to show them around Cape Town. There could have been no indication to the accused that Mr. Tonga was anything other than a law-abiding shuttle operator and a guide. Can this court, without some cor credible corroboration, for one moment accept that the accused, after he had been in Mr. Tonga's company for approximately 30 minutes, would, without more, approach him with a request that he find somebody to kill his business partner? It is even more improbable that Mr. Tonga, who says he has never been involved in any criminal activity, will virtually immediately agree to contact his friend, Mr. Malombo, to obtain the services of a hitman, even if one accepts that he was offered 5,000 rand at that stage. It must be kept in mind that Mr. Tonga testified that in a good month he earned between 30 and 40,000 rand per month with his car. Again, the question arises. Would such a person risk his vehicle, his income, his future, and his freedom for a mere 5,000 rand? It is equally strange that Mr. Tonga immediately approaches Mr. Mlombo, who is a hotel receptionist, who on his own evidence has the wherewithal to contact people telephonically because he works as a receptionist in the hotel. It is even stranger that Mr. Mbalombo, without any promise of financial gain, almost immediately agreed to assist by phoning Mr. Kwabe. Clearly aware of these problems, Mr. Mop argued, with reference to State versus Francis 1991, 1, South African Criminal Law Reports 198A, that it is not necessarily expected of an accomplice that he should be wholly consistent and wholly reliable or even wholly truthful. The ultimate test, after cautiously considering the accomplice's evidence, is whether the court is satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that in its essential features the story he tells is true. The passage upon which Mr. Mop relies must be looked at in context. At 205E to G, Smallberger J.A. stated, in my view, these evidence has not been shown to be substantially flawed. There are no material contradictions or inconsistencies in his evidence, nor are there improbabilities in his evidence of such a degree as to render his veracity suspect. He has not been shown to have been a deliberately untruthful witness. At best, for accused number five, it can be said that D was not a perfect witness who gave unblemished evidence. 
it is not necessarily expected of an accomplice before his evidence can be accepted that he should be wholly consistent and wholly reliable or even wholly truthful. The ultimate test is whether after due consideration of the accomplice's evidence, with the caution that the law enjoins, the court is satisfied beyond all reasonable doubt that it, in its essential features, the story he tells is true. By contrast, sorry, end of quote. By contrast, in Mr. Tongo's case, there were manifest material contradictions and inconsistencies in his evidence. And, as pointed out, there are a number of improbabilities of such a degree as to render his evidence suspect. In my view, Mr. Tongo's evidence is of a very poor quality. It was conceded by Mr. Mock that there were deviations and contradictions, but he argued that his evidence was not of such poor quality that the court can draw a proverbial line through it. But that is not the test. The test is, approached with a required caution, I can find that his evidence is such that a reasonable court, acting carefully, might convict. There are undoubtedly aspects of Mr. Tongo's evidence which implicate the accused. But his evidence is of such a poor quality that one simply does not know where the lies end and the truth, and the truth begins. A court should not, under those circumstances, cherry-pick certain parts of his evidence which can possibly be accepted and others which should be rejected. Reliable corroboration is required in such circumstances. In con sharp contrast, when his evidence is considered with that of Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mlombo, the picture becomes even bleaker for the state case. I will now proceed to discuss the evidence of the two other accomplice witnesses, Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mlombo. Mr. Kwabe. Mr. Kwabe's evidence in chief was that he received a call from Mr. Mlombo on the Friday evening. He told him that there was a job that needed to be done. He agreed that Mr. Mbalombo could give his telephone number to the person who wants the job done. He testified that Mr. Tongo called him later and told him that he obtained his number from Mr. Mbalombo and that he had a job that needed to be done, namely, somebody needed to be killed. Mr. Tongo also inquired how much it would cost. At the time, Mr. Kwabe was in Mr with Mr. Mgeni and asked Mr. Mgeni whether he would be prepared to partake and what he would charge. Mr. Mgeni said that he would do it for 15,000 Rand. It was then agreed with Mr. Tongo that they would meet the following day and discuss the matter. On Saturday, Mr. Kwabe received a call from Mr. Tongo and they arranged to meet at the Kaya Bazaar in Kailija. Mr. Tongo described the motor vehicle which he would be driving. Mr. Kwabe waited for him at the agreed place, and when Mr. Tongo arrived, he recognized the car. Mr. Kwabe introduced himself as Spra, which was his next name. Mr. Tongo told him that there was a husband who wanted a wife killed. He told Mr. Tongo to wait because he is not in this alone and that they must go to his friend's house, who transpired to be Mr. Mgeni. Mr. Mgeni joined them in the vehicle and introduced himself to Tongo as Kolile. Mr. Tongo then told Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni that there was a husband who wanted the wife killed and that had to look like a hijacking. Mr. Tongo told them which route he was going to be taking and explained that he would drive to Guguletu near Mazzoli's and they agreed on where the hijacking would take place, which was on the corner of NY112 and NY108. They also agreed that the remuneration of 15,000 rand would be paid and told Tongo to leave the money in the cubbyhole. It was agreed that the woman would be killed, but nothing would happen to Tongo and the accused. Mr. Tongo told them that he would give them a call when he left and that it would be something past seven 
on this Saturday evening. On the Saturday evening, Mr. Tonga called Mr. Kwabe saying that they were now leaving the hotel. Mr. Kwabe phoned Mr. Mgeni, but they struggled to get transport. On their way, Mr. Tonga phoned them and informed them that he had already left Kukuletu because they were not at the appointed time when he arrived and that he was on his way to Somerset West with the accused and the deceased. They agreed, quote, to let the matter stand over for another time, end quote. Mr. Tonga again phoned Kwabe at a later stage and informed him that he was at a restaurant in Somerset West slash Strand and told him that, quote, the job had to be done the same evening. The husband wanted his wife killed the same evening, end quote. Mr. Tonga also inform, informed him that he would be taking the same route to Guguletu and that he and Mr. Mgeni should meet him at the place agreed upon. Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni got a lift to Guguletu. Mr. Mgeni had Mr. Kwabe's Norinko pistol. Mr. Kwabe was unarmed but took yellow kitchen gloves along to prevent fingerprints. Mr. Kwabe received a text message from Mr. Tongo to say that he was close by. They then saw Mr. Tongo's car approaching. Mr. Mgeni stopped Mr. Tongo's car by pointing his firearm at the occupants. Mr. Kwabe got in behind the steering wheel and Mr. Mgeni got into the front passenger seat while Mr. Tonga got into the back seat. Mr. Kwabe stopped at the intersection near to the police barracks where Mr. Tonga was ordered out of the car. As Mr. Tonga was getting out, he told them in Kosa that the money was in the pouch behind the front passenger seat. Mr. Kwabe then drove with the accused and the deceased along the N2 in the direction of Kailisha. They had no plan as to what they would do. He took the Baden power turn off and stopped between Harare and Kuyasa, where the accused was ordered out of the vehicle. He then drove further with the deceased and Mgeni in the car into Mue between Harare and Mglovini, an informal settlement. While driving down Mue Way between Elita Park and Mglovini, Mr. Kwabe heard a gunshot. He was shocked when he heard the gunshot and asked Mr. Mgeni what he had done. Mr. Mgeni replied that he had shot the woman. He then took the first turn off into Elita Park and stopped on the side of the road. Mr. Kwabe testified that when he got out of the vehicle, he noticed that Mr. Mgeni was looking for something in the back of the vehicle. He informed Kwabe that he was looking for the cartridge case. Mr. Kwabe assisted him to look for it and found it, and they then left the car. Mr. Kwabe threw the cartridge case in a stormwater drain, and a little further away, he threw away the gloves that he had been wearing. Mr. Mgeni then took the money from the pouch. Mr. Kwabe was not certain when Mr. Mgeni removed money from the couch, although he thinks it was so shortly after Mr. Tonga had told them where the money was. They counted the money and found that it was only 10,000 rand. They shared it between them and Mr. Kwabe then went home. On the Sunday, Mr. Kwabe phoned Mr. Mlombo. He wanted to see Mr. Mlombo because they were short paid in that they were paid 10,000 rand instead of the 15,000 rand agreed upon. Mr. Mlombo apparently undertook to sort this out with Mr. Tonga. Mr. Mgeni returned Mr. Kwabe's firearm. Mr. Kwabe testified that he thinks he had further contact with Mr. Mlombo to find out how far Mr. Mr. Mbulombo got to recover the money that was short. Mr. Kwabe assisted the police to retrieve the cartridge and one of the gloves that he had thrown away. He eventually pleaded guilty and admitted his involvement in the matter. He explained that Mr. Tonga's number does not appear on his list of contacts on his cell phone as he deleted it after the incident. Cross-examination. During cross-examination, it soon appeared that Mr. Kwabe was a self-confessed liar. 
He conceded that after his arrest, he applied for bail and testified on oath in the bail application that he had an alibi defense to the charges against him. This he maintained for a period of almost two years before he decided to plead guilty. There are various aspects of his evidence that are unsatisfactory, but there are two that stand out and require particular scrutiny. Subheading Mr. Malombo's evidence. Mr. Kwabe was questioned about Mr. Malombo's role and testified as follows. Quote, as far as you are aware, apart from Monday phoning you and giving Zola your telephone number, did Monday have anything further to do with this incident up until the Sunday? Answer, I think maybe he would have asked, have we met with a guy, something like that. So we might have communicated, I'm not sure. So he might have asked you whether you have met. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. But he was not actively involved in arranging things, giving messages, talking to you, that sort of thing. No, sir. Not at all? No. When questioned more specifically about Mr. Mlombo's role in the events, he testified as follows. What was his role in this affair? He was the one that put me in contact with Zola. Question. Yes. No, I understand that according to you, he put you in contact with Zola. Yes. Did he have any other role to play? Not that I know of. He was the link between me and Zola. Yeah. Yes, sir. And then that's all he did, and then he was out of it, right? He was the link, sir. I said that's all he did. He linked you and Zola, and for the rest, he was out of it. Yes, sir. When he was asked whether he spoke to Mr. Mblombo on the Saturday, he replied that he could have spoken to them. He then testified as follows. For what purpose, sir? Maybe if Zola didn't come to confirm, you know, things like that. Question, now why would you phone him if Zola didn't come to confirm that? What does that mean? Why would you do that? No answer. I'm waiting for a reply. I don't know, sir. Was M Monde Malombo not deeply involved in what happened that Saturday when the accused and his wife were hijacked? The answer, deeply involved would be a strong word, sir, because he was only the contact between me and Zola. He wasn't even at the meeting, sir. There was no reason for him to discuss this matter with you at all on the Saturday afternoon and evening. Is that what you are saying? The only time I recall discussing the job was the Friday with Monday. With this attitude, he persisted. Even when he was confronted with the audio recordings of a phone call from Mr. Malombo to him, in which Mr. Malombo told him, it's the thing we were talking about, it must happen today, he replied that he did not recall that call and reiterated that Malombo was nothing more than a link. He could, however, not explain why, if Mr. Malombo was merely a link, there were so many calls made between him and Mr. Malombo and between Mr. Malombo and Mr. Tongo during the course of the Saturday. There can be no question that Mr. Kwabe was at all times aware of the role that Mr. Malombo was playing, particularly if one has regard to the contents of the audio recordings of the telephone conversations and the number of calls and attempted calls made by Mr. Malombo on the Saturday night to Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Tongo. Next subheading, the shooting of the deceased. Mr. Kwabe testified that Mr. Mgeni shot the deceased while he was sitting in the left front passenger seat with a firearm in his left hand pointing at the deceased who was sitting on the back seat. He had his right shoulder to the back and his left shoulder was turned with a firearm pointing at the deceased. Dr. Verster, who testified on behalf of the state, testified that the single shot that killed the deceased was an angled contact shot, 
She further testified that the shot would immediately have rendered the deceased paralyzed. It is clear from the photographs of the deceased position after the attack that she was very close to the backrest of the rear seat. According to Dr. Verster, the deceased's left hand would have been against or very close to her chest when the shot was fired. In fact, the state's ballistic expert, Warrant Officer Engelbrecht, conceded that it would not have been possible for Mr. Mgeni to have shot the deceased from the position in which he claimed he was. Mr. Kwabe's explanation as to how the deceased was shot also does not explain the marks of a right hand found on the left lower leg by Dr. Verster. Mr. Kwabe's evidence as to how this incident took place and how Mr. Mgeni shot the deceased can, with reference of the objective facts, not be correct. I say this for the following reasons. On the state's case, Mr. Mgeni could not have shot the deceased while he was seated on the left front passenger seat. His explanation does not cater for the marks on the deceased's left lower leg. Dr. Verster's evidence is that these bruises were caused by fingertips and were sustained before she died. She would have been immediately paralyzed after the shot and would have died virtually instantly. These marks un undoubtedly indicate some form of struggle. This is irreconcilable with Mr. Kwabe's evidence. Primer residue was found on the web of the glove that Mr. Kwabe wore between the thumb and the forefinger. Although, according to the evidence of Lieutenant Colonel Mlabateki, this could have been the result of Mr. Kwabe being in close proximity of where the shot was fired. It must, however, be borne in mind that primer residue was found where one would normally expect to find it if a firearm was fired by a person holding the firearm in that hand. It is common cause that glove marks corresponding with Mr. Kwabe's type of glove was found on the outside of the left rear door by a fingerprint expert. Mr. Kwabe tried to explain this by stating that it might have happened when he opened the door to look for the cartridge case, but hereafter his evidence disintegrated into a garbled mess. According to Lieutenant Colonel Mlabateki's evidence, Primer residue can be transferred from, for instance, a glove contaminated with primer residue to surfaces coming into contact with a glove. In this regard, it is important to note that primer residue was found to be present on the inside handle area of the driver's door. No primer residue was found to be present in the area around the left front passenger seat where Mr. Mgeni was supposed to have been sitting. There are other questionable aspects of Mr. Kwabe's evidence. According to the state case, Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Mgeni were to shoot and kill the deceased after they had dropped off the accused. Yes, after they had dropped off the accused, they did not go to the nearby bushy areas, but instead drove back into the re residential area down Mew Way, which was one of the major roads in that area in the direction of the N2. When Mr. Kwabe was questioned about this and asked where they were going to, he stated that they were going to no specific place. He could also not give a reason as to why they decided to drive back into the residential area if they knew that they now had to kill the deceased. This evidence should be looked at carefully against the reference to a fifth person in Mr. Mbolombo's telephone conversation with Mr. Tongo on the Saturday evening. Mr. Kwabe's evidence is, of course, contradicted by the evidence of most, both Mr. Malombo and Mr. Tongo, as far as their discussions on the Friday evening are concerned. I have dealt with these aspects, and I'm not going to repeat them. Mr. Kwabe also contradicted Mr. Tongo's evidence that he was not aware that the person had to be killed was the accused wife, but the accused business partner who would be arriving on the Saturday. Mr. Kwabe persisted 
that when Mr. Tonga phoned him on the Friday night, he told him that there was a husband who wanted his wife killed. Mr. Kwabe also testified that the 15,000 Rand remuneration was a price determined by Mr. Mgeni and not Mr. Tonga, as he stated in his evidence. I now come to the evidence of Monde Malombo. Mr. Malombo was also an accomplice witness and he was warned in terms of Section 204 of the Criminal Procedure Act in respect of all five charges. Mr. Mlombo testified that Mr. Tonga telephoned him at his workplace on the afternoon of the 12th of November, and he informed him that he was on his way to the hotel where he worked. Upon his arrival, Mr. Tonga asked him whether he knew of anybody who was a hitman. They then moved outside the lobby of the Protea Hotel. Mr. Mlombo told him that he did not socialize with criminals. However, he said that he would make inquiries from a person whom he called Abongile. It is common cause that Abongile is a reference to Mr. Kwabe. Mr. Mbulombo and Mr. Kwabe had previously worked together on a project called the Pride of Table Mountain. They last had contact in 2006, but purely by chance, on the 1st of November 2010, they met at Monwabizi Beach. On that occasion, Mr. Kwabe was apparently in the company of people who looked like criminals. During the course of the conversation, Mr. Kwabe asked him, Mr. Mlombo, whether he had any people who were bothering him or worrying him, and that he had, if he had, he must just phone Mr. Kwabe they exchanged phone numbers. Shortly thereafter, Mr. Mbalombo's son fell ill and he approached Mr. Kwabe to obtain a bullet from him in order to use the powder thereof on the advice of a traditional healer. Mr. Mbalombo uh, explained that because he was supplied with this bullet by Mr. Kwabe, that was the reason why he thought he could approach Mr. Kwabe be the hitman. Mr. Mbalombo stated that he told Mr. Kwabe that there is this person called Zola, and he told him about the job and the nature thereof. He told Mr. Kwabe that he knew Mr. Tonga and that Mr. Tonga would pay 15,000 Rand for the job. Mr. Kwabe, at one stage during the conversation, indicated that they should not discuss the matter on the phone, but that they should rather meet. According to Mr. Mlombo, Mr. Kwabe indicated that he would have no problem to do the job. After Mr. Tonga had left, Mr. Mlombo telephoned Mr. Kwabe in order to reassure him that he knew Mr. Tonga and that he could be trusted. Mr. Mlombo testified that he received a call from Mr. Tonga on the morning of the 13th of November 2010, who requested that he accompany him to a meeting with Mr. Kwabe in order to discuss, quote, how to go about in doing this, end quote. Mr. Mlombo contacted Mr. Kwabe and informed him that Mr. Tonga would be coming to Kailisha. Mr. Mlombo said that he waited for Mr. Tonga to meet him at his home in Kailisha. Mr. Tonga was aware that Mr. Mlombo's shift at the Protea Hotel started at 3 o'clock. Mr. Tonga did not arrive at Mr. Mlombo and Mr. Mlombo went back to the taxi rank, rank at site C, but shortly after his arrival there, Mr. Tongo contacted him and said that he was on his way. After Mr. Tongo arrived, Mr. Mlombo got into Tongo's vehicle. Tongo gave him a lift to work. In the vehicle, Mr. Mlombo inquired from Mr. Tongo why he was looking for a hitman. Mr. Tongo informed him that there was a married couple and that the husband wants the woman to be killed. Mr. Mlombo then wanted to know which woman and how he had met these people. Mr. Tongo informed him that he had met the people at the airport and, quote, it is the man who wants his wife to be killed, end quote. Mr. Mlombo testified that while he and Mr. Tongo were driving towards Mr. Mlombo's work, 
Mr. Tonga received a phone call and then said, here is the gentleman that we are talking about, the man who wants his wife to be killed. It's a quote from here to killed. Mr. Tonga then explained on the phone, and all Mr. Lombo could hear was Mr. Tonga saying, I'm coming, I'm coming. Mr. Tonga thereupon put his phone down and said that the gentleman did not trust him. Mr. Tonga then informed him that he had to go and take the accused to change, uh, accused to change dollars into rands so that he could pay the killers. He added that the accused did not want to go to a, quote, legitimate place where the dollars are being changed for rands because he, the accused, did not want to be charged tax. Mr. Tonga also informed Mr. Mbalombo that the couple was from overseas and that it was not the first time that the accused had done this, in inverted commas, that he had been in South Africa before, done this, in inverted commas, before, and he wants to do it again, but it should appear to be a fake hijacking. Upon arrival at the Protea Hotel, Mr. Tongo said to Mr. Malombo that he had to rush to Kailicha to meet Mr. Kwabe. During his evidence in chief, Mr. Malombo described his role as follows. Quote, to make sure that Zola and Abongile meet and to see to it that this thing happens, end quote. Later he elaborated by stating that the reason why he had further telephonic contact with Mr. Kwabe was to get things into order, to make sure that things go according to how they are planned. Mr. Mlomba testified that he knew that the person involved was a married couple and that Mr. Tonga was going to drive them to a restaurant in Somerset West where they would have dinner. Mr. Kwabe telephoned Mr. Mlombo at approximately 1900 hours that evening and informed him that he was looking for Mr. Tonga, but that Mr. Tonga's phone was switched off. Mr. Mlombo eventually <coughs> Mr. Mlombo eventually got hold of Mr. Tonga and informed him that, quote, these guys are looking for gloves, end quote. He explained that this related to an earlier request from Mr. Kwabe on the Saturday morning to inform him that they wanted gloves so as not to leave any fingerprints behind. Mr. Mlombo stated that when he heard that the person who had mandated this killing was going to pay 15,000 rand, he indicated that he would have have to pay for all his effort in, also have to be paid for all his effort in this matter, even if it was 5,000 rand. There was, however, no firm agreement on the amount to be paid. Mr. Mbalombo testified that during a telephone conversation on the Saturday afternoon with Mr. Tonga, Mr. Tonga informed him that he was going to place the money in the cabriole of the vehicle. Mr. Mlombo stated that Mr. Tonga was supposed to have met with Mr. Kwabe to give him the money, but that they could not meet. Mr. Mlombo also inquired from Mr. Tonga during the same telephone discussion whether he managed to get the gloves that they earlier spoke about. Mr. Mlombo testified that it was after this conversation with Mr. Tonga that Mr. Kwabe telephoned him looking for Mr. Tonga and informed him that they were supposed to meet. When Mr. Malombo finally got hold of Mr. Tonga, Mr. Tonga informed him that his phone was switched off because he was, quote, with the people, in brackets, the Dewanis, at a table, end quote, and that that was the reason why he could not answer his phone. Shortly thereafter, Mr. Malombo received a phone call from Mr. Tonga, who informed him that they were leaving the restaurant and that they were going to Guguletu. According to Mr. Mlombo, he did not know exactly where in Guguletu this would happen, only that it would happen in Guguletu. Mr. Mlombo testified that Mr. Kwabe informed him that, 
As the people were coming to Guguletu, they will take the vehicle and then go to Kailicha. They will then drop off Mr. Tonga, as well as the husband, and then they will drive on with a wife. Mr. Kwabe also informed Mr. Mulombo that they were going to stop the people, take the vehicle, and then go to Kailisha. Mr. Mulombo testified that he did not know exactly where in Kailisha they were going to do this, only that it was going to take place in Kailisha and that they were going to leave the vehicle there and thereafter wash the vehicle. On Sunday, 14 November 2010, Mr. Mulombo was at home and tried to call Mr. Tonga but could not get hold of him. Mr. Mulombo said that Mr. Kwabe arrived at his home on the Sunday morning at about 10 o'clock and informed him that the money that Mr. Tonga gave him was short by 5,000 rand. Mr. Mulombo testified that at that stage Mr. Kwabe was so angry that he did not ask Mr. Kwabe about whether he, Mr. Mulombo, would be paid. Mr. Kwabe wanted to know where Mr. Tonga was, and Mr. Mulombo informed him that he did not know. Mr. Mulombo then asked Mr. Kwabe what had happened, and Mr. Kwabe told him that he should not ask a lot of things, and whether he did not see on TV what had happened. Mr. Kwabe also requested Mr. Mulombo to inform Mr. Tonga that Mr. Kwabe wanted his additional 5,000 rand. On his arrival at work on the 15th of November 2010, Mr. Mulambo read about the incident in the newspaper. He then realized that they had really killed the woman. On Wednesday, 17 November 2010, Mr. Mulambo was contacted by Mr. Tonga, who informed him that he was phoning from his girlfriend's telephone. Mr. Tonga informed him that the police contacted him about the shooting incident that he didn't tell them the truth, and that he just told the police that he does not know anything. Mr. Mulombo then informed him that Mr. Kwabe was looking for him. Mr. Tonga then warned him, Mr. Mulombo, to get away from those guys, in inverted commas, as they were very dangerous. Mr. Mulombo was arrested on the 18th of November 2010. He made a warning statement to Lieutenant Colonel Barkaisen. Thereafter, he was interviewed and he was advised that police were going to take down a statement in terms of Section 204 of the Criminal Procedure Act. This statement was made on the 19th of November 2010, again to Lieutenant Colonel Barkaisen. Mr. Mbulombo was released after he had made these two statements. At the beginning of his evidence, Mr. Mulombo admitted that he had lied in his warning statement and in his statement to the police in terms of Section 204 of the Criminal Procedure Act. He also admitted that he had lied during his evidence in the Mgeni trial. He, however, t testified that his lies were limited to downplaying the extent of his involvement in this matter. Mr. Mulombo testified that the Provisions of Section 204 were not only explained to him on two occasions, but that he understood what they meant. Shortly before the commencement of this trial, Mr. Mulombo made yet another statement correcting certain errors and or lies in his previous statement. He stated that after a lengthy consultation with the prosecution team, and after having been given the opportunity to view the CCTV footage and listen to the audio recordings, he realized that he could no longer hide and had to open up and be honest. Before Mr. Mbulombo proceeded with his evidence, he delivered a pre-prepared speech, which from the record appears to be very similar to a similarly emotive speech which he gave to the court in the Mgeni trial before blatantly lying about material aspects. Those aspects about which he lied had nothing to do with hiding his involvement in the matter. Be that as it may, Mr. Mbalombo's evidence unraveled during cross-examination. He started to contradict himself on each and every material aspect of his earlier evidence. I do not intend to deal with all these contradictions. Mr. Mbalombo is a self-confessed liar. He admitted in court that he denied, lied when he posed to his warning statement on the 18th of November. 
He lied when he deposed to his 204 statement on the 19th of November 2010. He lied when he testified before Justice Heaney in the Mgeni matter, and he also admitted that he had concealed his own involvement and knowledge on those previous occasions since he was fearful of what the repercussions would be. As his evidence progressed, it became more and more clear that he was deeply involved in this entire incident and played a very important role. I mentioned but one example. Mr. Mbilombo testified that the accused testified Mr. Tongo in his presence shortly before 3 p.m. on the Saturday afternoon on their way to the Protea Hotel. Mr. Tongo told him that he had to take the accused to exchange dollars into rands in order to be able to pay the killers. It is however common cause that no such telephone call ever took place. It is further common cause that by that time, Mr. Tongo had already taken the ex accused to exchange the money. Mr. Malamba testified about a further call which was supposed to have taken place between him and Mr. Tongo at 19 hours 30 on the Saturday evening when Mr. Tongo explained to him that the reason why he could not answer his phone was because he was, quote, sitting at the table with a couple, end quote. Similarly, it is common cause that no such call between Mr. Tongo and Mr. Mbilombo ever took place and that Mr. Tongo was never inside the restaurant with the accused and the deceased. In addition, there are stark contradictions between the evidence of Mr. Mbilombo Mr. Tongo and Mr. Kwabe on all material aspects. Mr. Mop argued that Mr. Malombo, in quote, an ironic twist, in quote, moved from protecting himself at all costs to asserting that he played a leading role in the events of the 12th and 13th of November 2010. This is hardly an ironic twist his leading role is supported by clear objective facts such as the phone records and the audio recordings. I cannot agree with Mr. Mop's argument that the incentive for Mr. Malombo to now actively involve, him, involve himself in communicating with Mr. Tongo and Mr. Kwabe is the prospect of receiving 5,000 Rand payment. This submission has only to be made to be rejected. To summarize, Mr. Tonga, who was the only witness who could link the accused to the conspiracy, gave evidence to the court which is so improbable and contains so many mistakes, lies, and inconsistency that one simply cannot know where the lies end and where the truth begins. I accept that at this stage of the proceedings, the credibility of a witness plays a limited role. But in my view, the evidence of these witnesses is so replete with fundamental contradictions on the key components of the state case that I can all but ignore it. In making this finding, I take into account that all three witnesses, Mr. Tonga, Mr. Malombo, and Mr. Kwabe, are intelligent people, and therefore more than capable of attempting to twist their version to implicate the accused. Mr. Tongo obtained grade 12 at the Malibu High School in Blue Downs. Thereafter, he became an insurance consultant. Then he became a VIP taxi driver with platinum escapes and then started his own shuttle service in 2010. Mr. Mulombo matriculated from the Modern Dam High School. Thereafter, he was employed until 2000 by the Pride of Table Mountain. He thereafter did a two-year course as an assistant educational officer presented by the Department of Environmental Affairs. He thereafter worked as a security guard and since 2007 was working at the Protea Hotel where he was dismissed as a result of his involvement in this matter. Mr. Kwabe attended Oda Moulin School and obtained an N2 in electrical engineering in 2003 at the Western Province Technical College in Pinelands. After his studies, he was formally employed until 2010 in the Alia as an assessor, as an assessor in an insurance company and thereafter assisted his mother 
These men are not typical of the criminal elements which one encounters in these courts. Each one of them impressed me as intelligent and bright, but at the same time calculated. They may have been amateurs in arranging a hit on a person's life, but I do not believe that any one of them would be so stupid as to take part in this crime for just a few thousand rand. On Mr. Tongo's own saying, he earned between 30 and 40,000 rand per month. Mr. Malombo had a, jo a job. Mr. Kwabe was formally employed until April 2010 and thereafter assisted his mother in her business. The inference is inescapable that these three gentlemen anticipated that there would be much more in them, in this for them than the 15,000 rand which they testified about. Mr. Mock argued that but for the tragic consequences of this case, the conduct of the three co-conspirators would have been comical. He said, I must look at the evidence of Mr. Tongo and Mr. Kwabe and Mr. Malombo in the light that they are not the A-team of hijackers. I, however, cannot ignore the fact that these are three intelligent men who testified, and each one of them was a self-confessed liar, self liar who continued lying to this court. On the question of whether I should grant Mr. Mbulombo indemnity from prosecution, I think I have said enough about his evidence to justify a refusal to grant him indemnity. I therefore refuse to grant him indemnity. As pointed out above, Mr. Tongo is a single witness who is also an accomplice witness. I have noted earlier that in these circumstances, the court must look for corroboration of his evidence. On the cases referred to, it is clear that such corroboration must be corroboration implicating the accused. Mr. Mopp attempted to persuade me that I could find corroboration in the circumstantial evidence. The evidence, such as it is, he was constrained to concede, does I ever not implicate the accused? Regrettably, there are many unanswered questions about what happened on this fateful night. I realize there is strong public opinion that the accused should be placed on his defense. I take note of that. I have heard the plight of the Hindocha family that they would like answers to the question. I have, however, taken an oath of office to uphold the rule of law and to administer justice without fear, favor, or prejudice. That I cannot do if I permit public opinion to influence my application of the law. If any court permitted public opinion or emotion to influence their judgments, it would lead to anarchy. I am obliged to follow the established legal principles regarding the discharge at the close of the state case. In the light of the analysis of the state case, there is no evidence upon which a reasonable court, acting carefully, can convict the accused, and I am, as I said, obliged to follow established legal principles regarding a discharge. The law is clear. The evidence of the accused, if he does not incriminate himself, can never strengthen the state's case. Even if the accused should enter the witness stand and is a wholly unsatisfactory witness, I will still be left with a weak state case which cannot, on any basis, pass legal muster. At this stage of the proceedings, I have a discretion as to whether or, gr whether or not to grant the application in terms of Section 174. This is a discretion which must, self-evidently, be exercised judicially. Having regard to the fact that I have already found that there is insufficient evidence upon which a reasonable court, acting carefully, might convict, the only possible reason at this stage for me refusing the application can be the hope that the accused will implicate himself during his evidence. To do so will be a manifest misdirection. See State versus Leboxer. Mr. Mopp argued that the evidence of Sergeant Mellet, 
Warrant Officer Stefanis, Captain Lutchman, and Captain Hendrickse, who all testified that the accused informed them that the deceased wanted to see the nightlife in the township and that it was at her request they drove back into Kuguletu. He argued that this shows that Mr. Tonga did not take the detour into Kuguletu of his own accord. This submission cannot be sustained. The entire hijacking and killing was planned to take place in Kailisha. But even if he is right, the issues raised by Mr. Mop can only be answered in favor of the, the state if the accused incriminates himself. The same applies to Mr. Mop's submissions regarding the accused's version that he gave the Hindocha family about the deceased killing. These statements do not bolster the state case. On the contrary, without the accused taking the witness stand and incriminating himself, they take the matter no further. This case, in my view, falls squarely within the ambit of the following dictum of Nugent A. J. in State versus Lubaxa, which for the sake of completeness, I repeat. Clearly, a person ought not to be prosecuted in the absence of a minimum of evidence upon which he might be convicted, merely in the expectation that at some stage he might incriminate himself. That is recognized by the common law principle that there should be, quote, reasonable and probable, end quote, cause to believe that the accused is guilty of an offense before a prosecution is initiated. And the constitutional protection afforded to dignity and personal freedom, bracket sections 10 and section 12, seems to reinforce it. It ought to follow that if a prosecution is not is that a prosecution is not to be commenced without that minimum of evidence, so too it should cease when the evidence finally falls below that threshold. In my view, the evidence pre presented in this case falls far below this threshold. In the circumstances, I make the following order. The application in terms of Section 174 of the Criminal Procedure Act is granted. The accused is found not guilty on this charge, and Mr. Malombo is granted indemnity, is not granted indemnity from prosecution. Court will adjourn.